Welcome to the Storytellers That Shaped the Face of Pop Culture track, sponsored by Nomura. The session will begin momentarily. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session in conversation with Pam Vesey and Wendy West. Please welcome our moderator, CEO <laughs> of the Opportunity Management Company, Brian Seth Hurst. Thank you, Tanya. Good afternoon. <laughs> so, I am so honored to be here with Pam Vesey and Wendy West. And if you've, how many of you have attended some of the other conversations? We're actually going to talk about women in television for the last 50 years, <laughs> even though none of us were born then. So, <laughs> sort of. um, so first I want to say, if you're, I'm sure you've read um, their illustrious bios online. Uh, Wendy is writer producer currently of Dexter. Um, do you sleep at night? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Just wondering. With drugs. <laughs> With drugs, okay. And um, her other credits are The Beast, The Closer, Law and Order SVU, Gideon's Crossing, and you were a Writers Guild nominee for the fourth season of Dexter, correct? Mm -hmm. Fourth and fifth. Great. Yeah. Fourth and fifth. Yeah. Um, current showrunner, writer, producer, director of CSI New York. Um, Pam Visay also did Ringer, which that was sad. Yeah. Great show, though. Um, in Living Color, I have no life. I just watch television. I love television, so. Uh, <laughs> in Living Color, The District, um, and Give Me a Break. Oh, you going back way so back. Far. And you are <laughs> one of the only women who's crossed all genres comedy, drama, procedural, and. Sketch comedy, yeah. Sketch comedy, yeah. Oh, yeah, in Living Color, yes. yeah. Yeah. Um, and an Emmy nominee. Yes. So, for In Living Color. Yes. Yes, congratulations. Thank so, you. so I, I want to talk about, you know, this business is tough enough for anybody to get into. But um, in my own background, my mother was actually the first uh, woman television producer in Philadelphia. And horror stories, which I didn't find out until years later when she was interviewed for the Archive for American Television. Otherwise, I would have been a, not, a lot nicer kid back then. <laughs> but how did you both get into television? Let's start with you, Wendy. And, and did, was it something you always wanted to do? Yeah, I mean, I was someone that um, grew up watching television, and when I looked back on my diaries from that time, they were just synopsis of what was on television that day. Um, and I had the good fortune to uh, go to grad school and um, work on specs, and I always thought I was going to do movies, and then I had like um, this crazy like fever for like two weeks and watched all of Northern Exposure. And I thought it was just the greatest storytelling and so inspiring. And it was a story told, you know, over many hours. And I thought that's, that's exactly what I want to do. And so I, then I really sort of shifted into, or just really woke up into doing television. And you your know? first job in television was? My first job in television was on a show called Three. And it was um, created by Evan Katz. And it was um, about uh, three spies and um, not at all like Northern Exposure, and it was a, it was a terrific learning experience. It was and really great. were you, um, what was your first position? Were you a writer's assistant or? No, I was a staff writer. A staff writer, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, so, Wow, great. Yeah, it was exciting. Oh, so long ago. Um, <laughs> I, I started on Give Me a Break. How appropriate is that? Give Me a Break. Um, I was the receptionist, and I sat at my typewriter, and wrote a script, um, oh, but well, that was my first. You upon yourself to write a spec script for? Yeah, I wrote a feature and a spec script for the show at the time called Valerie, starting Valerie Harper. She had 
to come back to television, and I fell in love with the show, and it was the mid-season. Prior to that, I had, no, I had no one in the business, no one in my family. My parents thought, what are you doing? They didn't understand it. Um, I came from the state of Washington and majored in journalism and political science at USC, but then fell in love with television, but had always loved television, watching it. Um, but got this great job as a receptionist and started to just, and it was a typewriter. I mean, I was thrilled to have that backspace button, you know, where it erased it and went forward. <laughs> so I sat at a typewriter and wrote some spec scripts and wrote that Valerie and got a job on Give Me a Break, my first spec script, and was thrilled. I had no idea how fortunate I was. I thought everybody wrote a script and Were there got other a job. women staff writers on Give Me a Break? There was one female writer, um, Mady Julian, who and her father Arthur Julian had been in the business for many years, and she was on the show. Um, and of course, the lead of the show was a female, Mel, Mel Carter. Well, um, yeah, she cracked a whip. Yeah, so we were. I was surrounded by people who were working in the business, and there were examples for me as a woman. Um, but I didn't know what was ahead because I was clueless, and I take pride in being sort of clueless at the time <laughs> because it makes you more courageous, I think. I think if you don't know what the obstacles are, if you just leap in because you have a passion, sometimes you don't prevent yourself from overthinking it. So when you, when you come into the business, were you uh, just, and I don't, I apologize if I'm going to sound sexist in any way, but because we were, I just had a conversation in the speaker's room about why women should be designing user interfaces instead of men, because it's basically more intuitive. And you know, you have, you have writers that specialize in structure and writers that specialize in character and, and dialogue. And there are a lot of men that write well for women how, when you look at, at the history of your careers, do you put that first or you say, well, I'm a writer or I should write this because I'm, I have a more sensitive or more intuitive point of view or do you think things are assigned? I'm just asking if there is, what's the difference in terms of if you're a woman writer, how, are you, how might you be treated differently in terms of what you do well versus what people perceive you should be doing? Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, think, I mean, I guess, I guess what you're asking is, when you're writing a script, I mean, do you do you anticipate, do you write differently because you're you're a woman? Like, do you write? Or are different, you different assigned? Strengths? Like, you know, yeah. they say, well, you know what? Um, so Dexter's girlfriend, you know, right, that that right. she really needs to come from this writer, right. you know. I mean, I, I guess I guess in my experience, it's just been that the story always comes first, and you 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 try to listen to the characters whatever their gender may or may not be, you know, or, and you try to write to, um, to the truth of that, of whoever they are, you know, independent of So it has of nothing that. to do with gender, but do you find yourself in the writer's room sometimes saying, if a guy is writing, like personally, I, as a writer, I think I write better women dialogue than men, mm -hmm. I don't know why, mm -hmm. it might have to do with my sexual preference, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but, you know, that sensitivity, do they say, you know, do you speak up and say this is not what this character would do because a woman responds this way? Is that? I mean, on, on occasion, sure. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to overthink this. But yeah. I don't think it yeah. happens as much as it used to. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm old school compared to Wendy. And yes, when I was hired, it was because they needed a woman. And sometimes they needed an app, specifically an African-American woman because they needed a voice. So when I started in the business, I was hired by description, not necessarily by content, you know, by what I've written. And what you have to do is overcome that by learning to um, write everything very well and break out of the box. And I did that quickly because I tended to be the girl on the staff of the guy shows, you know. Um, so um, it's it when it, when it when I started, yes, you most women, they would add a woman because we need a woman's voice. Um, you were not in the same pile of scripts being read as the guys. Um, but I think that's changed quite a bit mm -hmm. now. People just read the script. And there are men that write tremendous emotional, female-driven scenes, as well as women who can really kick butt and write action mm -hmm. and you know, take, us, take down people. We, we write really gory men. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Violence and drama, yeah. I, I think you know when you look at, well, I want to ask you whether you think now how just over the course of your careers, how Hollywood has changed for women writers. 
Um, you know, we I talked about Barbara Corday and Barbara Avedon and Cagney and Lacey, yeah. you know, kind of paving the way. Yeah. And you had two central female characters. Um, and I now look at Anthony's new uh, project, Cybergeddon, and the lead is a very strong female. It's a great character. Um, but how have women's roles in the writer's room changed since you both got into the business? And I guess for me, there are more women, you know, I would say. Like, mm -hmm. on our staff, we're pretty evenly divided. And it's, it's a gift, you know. It's, it's a luxury to, to, to have that kind of equality, you know. Um, and it didn't used to be that way. And it used to be that there were, mm -hmm. the numbers are, were not so equal, you know. Um, and it's, I guess, I guess as we move forward, we just try to, you know, we, we try to move forward as equally as possible. Well, it's, you know, you know the, the thing is, is now you have women, sh more women showrunners now than ever before. Yeah. Um, you know, and you have Shonda Rhimes, and she's got, what, three shows on the yeah. air now. And, mm -hmm. you know, so you, you have these things really moving forward. So you sort of have watched the whole change over the history of your career. Yeah. Um, as I said before, I was always the woman in the room. There were not often a lot of women. And um, I, remember, I remember the first time I was on a staff with other women writers. It was quite refreshing. Um, and then I remember a staff that I created as a showrunner that had more women than men. And it was actually on one season of CSI New York. Um, and I think that's incredibly rare. Um, but what you have to do is, you know, producers and executive producers and showrunners, they don't, they don't, they sit down and read good scripts and they hire the best people. I was just going to say, I have this feeling that you, you are gender neutral, gender neutral in oh, your hiring yes. now because, yeah. you know, clearly, I mean, and CSI New York is both very tight shows, really tight shows. And the fact is you, you're, the budgets that you work to are a little different than the budgets that you work to and you've got the pressure of ratings in a different way than you have. So you have different pressures weighing on you. But the idea of the, of the showrunner now putting the story first and, and coming up, that, that is always it. So now with story first and with the decisions that you have to make as a business person, so now you're up there, you know, and I, I've watched, I mean, my three greatest mentors in Hollywood for me were women, Ann Sweeney being one of them, Betty Cohen being another, and, and just watching these women themselves navigate Hollywood, uh, uh, you know, and navigate what, what was essentially an old boy's world, and then come to the top of the heap and, and be able to run networks in a way that, um, that has no gender distinction as far as I'm concerned, but excellent politicians. And I, mm -hmm. I do think that there is a, and again, I don't want to sound sexist, but I do think that there is, I, I've worked for women and I've worked for men. And there's something about working for women if, if my male pride is out of the equation, where it seems more intuitive and it seems that I am not ordered to do something, I am persuaded. You haven't worked for me. I haven't worked for you. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I don't think it's by gender whether someone's strong or persuasive or anything like that. I, I I'd like to say when women are gentler, kinder showrunners, but I can't honestly say that. Um, again, I've only I've only had. You know, the I'm asking you all these questions because I want the line to not be there at all. That's why I'm coming <laughs> right. from this point of view. Yeah, of course. So. Um, but I I, I think um, women now feel comfortable stepping into those shoes. Um, I feel like um, they're given the opportunity to run a show. They're not judged on, are they doing it like a woman? They're judged on, is it the quality of the work they're producing and are they executing it? Um, both myself, Carol Mendelson, and Ann Donahue are all the showrunners yes. of the franchise, of, CSI, of the CSI franchise. Um, each of us had completely different experiences getting to that point, but worked our way toward uh, becoming showrunners. We run the shows, the shows quite differently, but we, we have hit shows on television that people watch, and I don't think they're, the audience is going, I think it's different because it's a woman. No, I don't, I don't think so either. I think you're, you're into the story and that's it. Yeah. And you know, the, the now television for showrunners is, a, is more a business than, you don't have the luxury of big dollars, right? 
Yeah, you, you're, it's, as your budget. You're making a lot of decisions. It's difficult. It, you start out being a writer, and it's such a pleasure. I mean, I, I have to be honest. I never thought I'd rise to showrunner. I didn't even know what it was when I started. I wasn't sure what the path was. I didn't have an example personally in my life, it, meaning constantly in my environment. So I would see other women in the business moving forward um, and say, wow, I, I want to do what they do. Um, but as a, now that you get to that position as a showrunner, you have to make business decisions and you think, wow, I should have paid attention in that little economics and business class. <laughs> do because you miss <laughs> not be, I mean, you have the freedom to be creative. You're, mm -hmm. You said to me, I am a writer producer. Mm -hmm. And so you get to concentrate on the story. Do you miss? Well, I don't miss it because I won't stop doing it. I am fundamentally a writer first. Every decision I make on the show is about what the end result is on the, con the content of the story. Maintaining Do the integrity of the story. of the story. And so I also write episodes. I also direct episodes. So I'm still involved. I could not do the job without doing that. I can't shake that. I was first a writer. Um, but you do have to make decisions um, that say, do we spend this money for this scene or do we prioritize something else and you start to change the texture of the story. But if, with enough practice, you can um, stay within the, the hope and dream of the writer and the integrity of your show. And it probably becomes intuitive after a while. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. We are, we're a show that CSI New York actually shoots mostly in, in Los Angeles. And we make a lot of different decisions on locations and what we choose to do because of what we need to afford. It's a very expensive place to shoot a television show. Interesting. And, and that it would not, because are there tax breaks in New York? I'm just curious. There are. are we just, we go several times a year, but we started the show yeah. in, in um, Los Angeles and is, we're just one of the few that still remain there. So who are your heroes when you look to television and people that you've respected and people that inspire you and things that you've seen on the air that have really mm -hmm. kind of shaped your, your view? I mean, I would say I would go back to Northern Exposure to David Chase, um, and I would go to Lena Dunham. You know, I think she is incredibly inspiring right now. Um, interesting that they are both uh, singular voices, which is what I think makes them both so successful, you know, and they are each telling a different version of a truth. Um, and I, I guess I also have uh, uh, heroes just of, of short fiction, like, like Ray Carver and Laurie Moore, that I uh, find equally inspiring and, and always informs my writing as well, you know, so. Um, well, as you know, I started in comedy. Mm -hmm. So um, I was in love with every woman on the Mary Tyler Moore show. Yeah. <laughs> All those women um, doing their comedy, Betty White and... Yeah. Valerie Harper and Mary Tyler Moore herself, and um, because uh, as I got in the business, I wasn't always exposed to women working in the business. Um, I did have experience when I first realized this might be something I wanted to do. Uh, I came to a panel just like this, and it was a woman who um, was talking about her career as a writer. And to this day, I have not found, I've been looking for this. If anyone can do the research for me, I'm looking for this woman. She was one of the first writers, female writers on the Bob Newhart show. And I remember her speech inspired me so that I started to research what is this I can do. I was in college at the time. It was just a Saturday seminar. And I, I knew at that moment I want to do what she's doing. Um, I, I've narrowed it down to three names. I'm still looking for that person. <laughs> Maybe she I spoke at Nazi left yes, a few for Yeah, years. I just want to say thank you because she inspired me um, because she talked about she had been a writer's assistant and she'd worked her way in and she was the girl on the staff and she was writing for Bob Newhart and I loved that show. And she was doing it and it was quite inspiring. So, you know, people getting into the business today, um, there are a lot of college interns that volunteer for NAPI, and they, they too are listening to you and being inspired. And there are so many opportunities because of new technologies for storytellers. You can break in on YouTube. You can, you know, build your own fan community. That's, you know, there are plenty of examples. Ian and Anthony and Smosh.com, they built a whole community around it. And yet, television is still, and if you listen to Mark Cuban's keynote speech, television is still the greatest mass medium. And so most of the people that I know that are starting in YouTube want to graduate to television. So that's one way in. If you were to advise 
people looking to get into the business, even people, because people come to the business late too. Um, it happens all the time. If you were advising people getting into the business today, because every route is different, what piece of guidance would you give them? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's tough. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I would say that, um, you know, everyone has their own voice, and the trick is to find it and hone it as, as best as you possibly can. And there are so many different platforms to get it out there. Um, that, I guess that would be my best advice, you know, to keep, keep writing. Keep writing. <laughs> keep writing, right. you know. It's like, a, it's like you're a business, you know. Like if you, if, even if it's a Saturday and it's raining, you still have to go and open up the shop. Yeah, my, you know? my nephew wanted to, is uh, a great writer, but when he first met with uh, Michael Langworthy, who was a showrunner, he said, if you really want to do this, you have to be prepared not to go to your own mother's funeral, but to be writing instead. Mm -hmm. And to, take, to make that kind of commitment. It takes a lot of commitment. Um, there's so many ways to break in the business now. Mm -hmm. It used to be work on a spec script and hope someone will read it as a writer. Um, but now you can create something in your home with your video, HD video camera, put it on YouTube. Um, I understand there have been shows that executives watch that they see these moments on YouTube and think that'll make a great show. Um, conversations, being in front of people, um, there's a lot more education now. I teach at USC in the Cinematic Arts um, College. I can't believe how many people in the TV business, Tim Kring, John, I mean, the list goes on that have come out of USC. It's yeah. just amazing. Yeah, yeah we're, it inspires you. And I, I was actually in the broadcast journalism and political science department, um, but through the journalism department was inspired to write. Um, so it's... There's so many places to learn to express yourself. There's so many um, opportunities to be creative over a weekend and put it on YouTube. Um, but you, in the end, you have to have the passion to take it the next step further. It's not easy. Um, it, not everybody's discovered that way. But keep writing, keep creating. If you want to be a director, get that camera out and you know, go pro it up a mountain. Do what you need to do. <laughs> Work it. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we talked about writing. Um, when you wrote that first spec script, um, were you aware of craft? Did that? I'm a, I'm a huge studier. I, I study everything. So I sat down and I watched every episode of the show, studied it, studied the format. I grabbed scripts. I studied that. Um, I also did that when I made the transition from comedy to drama. I sat down with a lot of David Kelly episodes of The Practice and Law and Order, and, um, or not Law and Order, but um, LA Law, and studied the craft on the page. And then I jumped into writing it. So I did the same with my comedy. I studied every script on the show. I went over them and over them. I still do that today. I, I moved from you know um, character-driven dramas into procedurals. and. When I first got there, I studied the format and, and the rhythm of the shows to learn the craft. Yeah, the rhythm is such a huge thing. Um, and even now with, um, you know, internet series like Cybergeddon, um, the rhythm of that series is different than it would be for a television show. So you're essentially writing the medium, but, but I'm sure we'd all agree up here that the bottom line in the core is good storytelling, strong characters, great canons in the story. <clears throat> I want to give you guys to a, a chance to ask, um, questions. Um, so we're, we're going to go to questions in about two minutes. Um, the, the new opportunities that are being brought about in storytelling. Um, you had said in the room, in the speaker's room, that you're old school. Um, <laughs> and do you think about these platforms, or are you so absorbed in your day-to-day -day jobs that you don't have a chance to think about where else a story could be told? I do think about them. Uh, <laughs> well, because I want to educate myself. I want to absorb everything. Um, because I'm fortunate enough to work on a production that's constantly going through the process. That's why I say I'm old school. I'm on a television show that's moving forward every single day. Um, but I learn it from my students when I teach. I learn what the, how they watch TV, why they watch it, where they get their information. I was shocked. To, I had a class that not one single student owned a television. They got their all their shows, all their television from a computer, a downloading, a streaming, something other than a television. Um, that's why I say I'm old school. I cling to my television. What would I do without it? Um, 
my kids can watch a movie on their phone or download something, and I'm fascinated that that little box is enough for them when I you know, want the luxury of my sofa and a big screen. Well, and also <laughs> when you're directing, you're, you're directing for that screen. Yeah. You're not thinking about this screen. It looks mm -hmm. great there on, on that screen. <laughs> it really does, I'm amazed. So um, I do think about it and I'm interested. And we've talked about webisodes, things that connect mm -hmm. our television episodes with something on the internet. Mm -hmm. We've attempted it. We, we have a Twitter, we, twi you know, we have tweets with our fans. We connect as much as we can. Um, and I look forward to the day where I leap right into creating something original directly for, you know, be it Netflix or, 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 the YouTube or, or something on, the, you know, the computer. Or the next disruptive yeah. platform. Yeah, <laughs> something, because I know, I feel like that's where it's going. When you, when you have a, a students who don't own a television, they don't, I, I, I feel like the networks will no longer have to program a night. They'll just have to have programming that you can shop like in a store. It's a button and an icon and then on the phone. it will all be about yeah. marketing and discovery. I think it'll be an icon on the phone and you push that icon and it'll come up and you'll watch it and you'll select something else so that there will be, the lines will blur between NBC, CBS, Showtime and all those shows. It will be everything you can choose right here. You put it in your shopping cart and, and, you, and, do you, think and you watch it. And looking at this just um, because, you know, Damon Lindelof is a well-known name now. He's got a whole fan base. He and Carlton used to talk to the fans of Lost. They know who he is. Yeah. People know who Tim Kring is. People know who Anthony is. People know who, who Dan Harmon is. And these guys are now becoming rock stars. So instead of, so now it's the showrunner as the personality that's driving the show, not necessarily the network. So maybe the future <laughs> is in their brand as much as is in the show brand that right. they create. Yes. Um, we had talked about um, uh, maintaining the integrity of the story world yeah. and that your concentration is on the series and yet there are casual games, there's a ton of fan fiction around Dexter yeah. and that could be a whole nother conversation. And then there are the books mm -hmm. and as the writer, uh, uh, producer, how do you look at the other expressions of the brand? For there, there's a clear division, I think, between the book and uh, the world that exists in the book that Jeff Lindsay created, and then the world that we've created on, on Showtime. And um, though Jeff has his own rights, and I think he's doing a comic book, and it's like that world has its own integrity, and then our world has its own integrity of, of what's happened you know, on the air. And that kind of separation, I guess, is kind of how we've been able to maintain it. Um, and we have you know, webisodes, and we tweet, and we have stories that uh, build on narratives that we've created, but they are world created in our world versus um, a world that is also in, in, in um, Jeff Lindsay's books. And is the fan base the same, or do you know if it's... I'm sure there's a lot of crossover, but the stories are, are, are a bit different. They diverge pretty quickly. Um, and so... Well, because you have season after season yeah, after season exactly, after season exactly, to create. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, great questions from the audience. I can't see from here. So if you're raising your hand, you have to raise it really high. <laughs> yeah. Yes. If you could tell us your name and what you do. Uh, Greg Smith, Tremor Video. Uh, big, big Dexter fan. And I thought season four was phenomenal. I'm actually at the end of season five right now. I'm curious, though, like particularly Dexter, but this also applies uh, for, for Pam as well. Uh, you know, when does it, you, you seem to be very focused on the story, which is wonderful, and how these characters interact. When does the, you know, particularly in the case of Dexter, he's how many, I, you know, I don't know what his kill count is. When does it make sense for the story to kind of have its natural ending? And I'm sure, I'm wondering when you kind of make the, you know, of course we want to get, keep this thing going on forever, but, and, and obviously there's been improvement in the story, in, uh, in my mm -hmm. opinion, over time. But w when does it, is it a kind of economic decision or is it kind of point where, hey, we've, we've pumped out all these different products, kind of storylines, when is the time for this to kind of naturally you know, end? I mean, it's a, it's a good question that I think we're actively wrestling with. And I think that the decision will be made on all, all the factors that you mentioned. It will be um, uh, Michael's choice to a great extent. You know, it'll be interesting to see um, how definitive it ends. You know, there, it may end in one way. It may, it may have another life. It may, may do many things, you know. It may turn to just a blank screen. It may turn to just a blank <laughs> screen and don't stop believing. Um, but um, it's it's just an act, I guess I guess the the short answer is it's just an active question we're wrestling with you know and and uh, to be continued you know 
I think that you know, that's a huge dilemma because when a show is successful, there are so many people that have a stake in the show. Showtime has a stake in the show. The writer has a stake in the show. The the having to infuse creative teams with new writers, with new imaginations to keep the show fresh and still keep the legacy that was there. I mean, it, to have a franchise that goes on is a tremendous amount of work, mm -hmm. especially if you're on a network and you're part of a larger franchise. It just, it's like a giant beast that just eats story, <laughs> it you does. know? And you just have to, and you, you know, it's like now, and I don't know, do you guys rely on your fan wikis at all to go back and figure out what you've done and who's done what? They'll tell us if we've made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> but because some shows actually yeah, okay. consult their own fan wiki. Yeah. yeah. We because, keep Because wait, no, that wasn't the phone number yeah. we said. What was the phone yeah, number? Yeah, Don't yeah. look it up yeah. on the fan wikis. No, her hair was blonde, and then you know. <laughs> so the idea that you to maintain a franchise is is brilliant, and to be able to keep something fresh and alive and not alienate the fans, and that's where Twitter comes in because you know there's some showrunners right now that are actually watching Twitter and listening and not changing the content per se, but bumping up the characters that are of more interest yeah. to the fans. Are you responsive to, to that kind of thing? At, in the moment, I would say like that kind of experience isn't one that we're having at the moment. You know, it's more it is more self-controlled and 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 whatever comes up in the room and our, and our showrunner decides that he's, we're going to move forward with. You know, do you guys read any of the fan fiction? Um, Yes, but not necessarily concurrently. Like sometimes afterwards, I guess you know every writer is a bit different with how they interface with it. But um, I guess I don't I don't read it as I'm writing it because I don't want to steal anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, yeah. I think um, unless there's one more question. So I I just want to mm -hmm. say first of all, I a huge fan of both your work. I had to go get the game immediately because, you know, the, the game on the iPad sort of gives you the experience. And then I thought, you know what, I don't want to be this murderer. I, I prefer <laughs> to be the voyeur. Um, but thank you so much for the impact that you've made. I mean, both shows are huge in pop culture, and that is the theme here. Dexter has taken off with a huge fan base, exceedingly loyal fans yeah. who are rabid and, <laughs> and have as much at stake in the story as the writers do. Yeah. And th that's a fascinating relationship that's developing. And uh, I'm interested to see how writers will respond in the future to increased feedback from the fans. And I think, that's, I think it's both a, a blessing and a curse. Yeah. And how to ride that management of the fan base, I think that might be the, do you agree that might be a challenge in the future? Potentially. I mean, I think, I think Dexter comes from a group of work, people that work really hard us in the writer's room to try to make the best show that we can make. And to the extent that we will interface with fans or not is to be determined, you know? Like, it's, it's, it's something that in our world needs to have its own integrity first, you know? Yeah. Well, but, Pam yeah. and Wendy, thank yeah. you so much for being here today. Thank you for being here today. And I look